Hello. The one, the only joining me today. Um, <laughs> this is one of those perfect examples of this really is an excuse for me just to hang out with my I haven't seen. I'm so glad yep. to have you back. Uh, I'm well. Thanks for having me. It's good to see and hear your voice. Uh, I, you know, it's been a strange year, and this is as close as we are going to get in <laughs> for yeah. a while. I know. I was thinking about. I was thinking about your background. It's like I've, I've been in that room, and it's like, yeah, yeah. I, I miss. I miss. Yeah, that's my whole rationale for. Now, I've known you a long time, but for those of us who are sitting here on the Twitter watching this later. Who are you? What, what's your background? What's your... Oh. Ah, well, um, it's, it's uh, nothing, nothing that stands out. Um, uh, let's see, a developer a for, <laughs> well, you're too kind. Um, I sort of, I actually started the game late. I, I got into software development in graduate school. So I haven't been doing this for a long time, but um been a developer for almost 20 years now. Um, I love that you say you haven't been doing it very long. How much right. longer than me? I guess some of, I guess some people do start playing with computers when they five and that's yeah. Yeah, actually no, no. That's me. true. Yeah, that's true. But you know, it's also I don't you know, the, the one thing that I often reminisce about and often wonder if I ever go back to school is not really having a formal like computer science education, right? Um, but, you know, sort of got into it, loved doing it, you know, like Nate. Uh, and, and then somehow I, I, I sort of view, uh, for those who are not familiar, I do quite a lot of public speaking around the US, around the world, along with Nate, I'm on the No Fluff Just Stuff Tour. Um, also uh, a trainer on O'Reilly's platform. I do workshops and I do corporate and client training as well. But I sort of view my, and I think it's true for many of us, maybe for you as well, Nate, uh, it's kind of like entering the World Wrestling Federation, right? So you, so you start off with like user groups. Um, I actually started off with brown bags back in 2004. Uh, then I did user groups. Then I did conferences in like Columbus. And then I did one in like Dayton. And then somehow ended up on the No Fluff Just Stuff Tour, which is usually, you know, where the, 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 the so, so some of many of the heavyweights tend to play or have played. Uh, but yeah, that's what I've always seen is that World Wrestling Federation, you got to play in the minor leagues before you show up in the big leagues. <laughs> um, but yeah, so, you know, my focus is, you know, Nate and I shared uh, an interest for a long time. I still have it. He seems to have moved on, which is front-end development, right? You and I did a lot of that. Um, and then last, you know, six, seven years, it's been DevOps, 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 containers, Kubernetes, CI, CD, pipelines, Terraform, Ansible, you know, every new shiny tool that shows up under that <laughs> massive umbrella is, uh, yeah, that's, that's, a, that's my background. Yeah. Because you have a short attack. I, I still love front end development. Don't get me wrong. It limits how much time we have in a given. Have to learn. Mm -hmm. I haven't had better or worse. And I still love it. There's been around. Influential book I've ever had. I'm just reacting to it. I'm not the person to tell you what you're angry Yeah, yeah. And, and you know, between you and me, um, the I forget the title of the, the book you just released uh, with O'Reilly. Oh, or, you know, that's the one I the just e the, finished the reading. Pamphlet, uh, that, that's right, the pamphlet. I no, just finished reading no that. <laughs> that's right. Uh, I just finished reading that. Um, and uh, just uh, about a third through uh, Neil and uh, Mark's book on software architecture fundamentals. So formally, I'm trying to get a view of the architecture world as it stands, you know, in, in, 
you know, the, the nice thing about being in the DevOps world is, well, to some extent, I'm not sure I've escaped it completely, but, you know, when I do step into architecture and design, I step in because whatever you are doing isn't lean enough, right, for DevOps, right? Like what, what you know, you, you are either, you think you have a microservice, but you don't, you know, just, just because you wrote a small service doesn't make it a microservice. It's just, if you're coupled heavily to everything else in the system and your deployment strategy is do A, B, C, D, then like Matt Stein says, you've just made a complicated monolith with, with all the problems of distributed computing. So that's when I step into architecture, but I've noticed that, whoa, I'm sorry about that. It's not, um, it's not your smoke detector. That happened to me last week. <laughs> I, was, I was doing a, a, a and smoke detector. Wife and myself. So I kept kind of like, will one of you please, love of all that is holy, turn off. And it went off like three or four. My wife actually called. I didn't even know this. The smoke detector 1 800 number called. Oh. I said we should vacuum it out. So she did that. And it, So real quick, um, our good friend Pratik, who's yeah. a fellow speaker in Manitou, he just messaged me saying he can hear me, but he can't hear you. Can't hear me? Uh-oh. Yeah. Yeah, he's listening in, and well, I'm actually glad Pratik's here, but... Um, well, that's fascinating, because it sure looks like I'm... See, this is the joy of the It's a Luke Goldberg machine. How about it? Yeah, I'm, I'm hearing myself on that. Hmm. Maybe I'm not loud enough. That's entirely possible. I don't have an interview. <laughs> so maybe what I'll do here is crank up. Drop yours. It can taste. Oh, he says he can barely hear you on Twitch, so it might be a volume. Barely hear me. All right, so let me. I'll just. I'll crank my volume all the way till it goes in the red. See, I've, I've got a new mic set up, and so that's part of the challenge. Is I have to like pick my face like right in the thing in order to pick it up. But learning, learning. It's a learning experience. Something. It's good times. Technology. Good times. It's technology. It sucks. I'll get around it. But yeah, it, it's. You and I were talking about when we first came on. This is this strange Rube Goldberg machine. I've got sound piping into things coming out of different. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. But we'll fix it in post something. I don't know. Yeah, post something. Uh, yeah, he says uh, he's half as loud as you are. So things are getting better. All right, all right. Well, we'll I'll just keep cranking you down until they can't hear you and they can. <laughs> <laughs> I mean. But when it does come to technology, I will admit I am absolutely horrible at it. Uh, like the the thermostat in the house is is Michelle's do uh, my wife's domain oh, because I cannot figure that thing out for the life of me. Uh, and she's always asking me. She's like, "Well, maybe we should think about you know getting a Tesla or you know." She's like, "Well, maybe we should get like a Roomba so that it can like." I keep telling her like, "You if you think that you know." machine learning has gotten so intelligent that they can figure out the layout of your house and you know somehow remember it day after day right you, either that's true or um we are going to be taken over by machines and the roombas will be leading the charge right yeah so, so we're talking about a terminator situation then is what i hear you saying so we're, the the Roombas are going to take over the world. I mean, it could happen, right? I mean, I I so we've we've reached that point in pandemic time where we haven't gotten through everything content wise. But my wife and I last night were realizing, okay, we finished this show. What show do we want to jump onto next? And I was flipping through you know the the nine hundred streaming services we all have because everything has their own dang streaming service, right? And, and so. We discovered Battlestar Galactica. I'm like, oh, that's right. I've been wanting to watch that. And so we, we went through that. Of course, there's a little bit of that going on, right? Where the technology we created comes back to try to wipe us out. So 
Sure, it could happen. That's a very common sci-fi trope, right? That the, 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 yep. the things we create will kill us. So it's, it's you know, very uplifting, very, very, very much like The Road, a good, you know, feel-good holiday book to get you ready <laughs> for 2020. So anyway, it's fun, isn't that it? That was a great movie too, by the way. Um, See, I read the book and couldn't bring myself to watch the movie. Because the the book put me in that place where I almost I almost couldn't read it, you know. After the first night, I was flipping through it. I'm like, this is really hard. And it, it's for those of you who aren't familiar with it, it, it's sort of this apocalyptic future, father son. And the positive I took out of it, sort of that love between a father and a son, and and what does that all mean? But it's a dark, dark book. And I remember that night. I think I actually I don't remember how old Everett was, but he was pretty young. And I really just wanted to go in his room and just like hug him. You know, just like snuggle with him because I'm like, oh my god, I, can't, I don't want that to be us. You know, so uh, yeah, yeah, not not maybe the the most fun reading for uh, for the holiday season. But, <laughs> you know, your mileage may vary. So, so is that what you're trying to do with DevOps? Like take over the world? Then is that what I hear you saying? You're trying to take over software engineering from the DevOps perspective? Um, I have come to the conclusion that well, for one, um, GitOps is is essentially where we are today. Um, sure. But while it's a big fancy buzzword, um, a lot of people don't understand that, yes, you can put everything in Git and yes, everything is a commit away from, you know, blah, blah, blah. Not everything works the same way like software does, right? Sure. So as an example, um, if you're doing, you know, work with like Terraform, which is a provisioning tool in the in the DevOps world, and it's a stateful tool. In other words, it remembers the last time you ran it, what did it do? So it only applies deltas there on forward. So it's it's not tearing up the whole world and rebuilding the whole world all the time. But the, the problem with that is if you, you know, in software, if you have three branches in Git, what you're saying is I have three realities in the world, right? Which may make sense. You may have, you know, a, the previous version in production that you're maintaining and the new version that's coming out, right? That that exists. That's the so thing. It's, it's the multiverse. Correct. But when exactly, when you, when you bring it down to things like Terraform, which are creating real things in the world, you can't have branches. Like that doesn't make any sense. Like you sure. can't have multiple realities. So all, to, all that to say is, yes, I think that, Today, after we are doing this for, oh dear, I've been doing it for eight years now. Um, you know, I, I sort of got in early on the bandwagon, but I have come to the conclusion that A, all developers need to learn, get a handle on DevOps. If that yeah. means you, you build a core team in your organization that does all the facilitating and, you know, sort of managing of the abstractions, but push it down to developers eventually. But at the same time, you know, it's, oh, I should say, also say this, developers make better DevOps engineers than, at least in my experience, a lot of operational folks do, because if, if, if the central tenet of storage mechanism is Git, mm -hmm. Git doesn't come easily to most people. Sure. Right? And if you throw someone in there and say, well, go create a branch here and rebase this over there, I mean, what? <laughs> so, uh, but all that to say, yes, I think, that if you are writing software today and you want to go lean, you have to have your DevOps story ironed out, you know, uh, otherwise there's just no, there's no future. So yes, I think uh, I'm not trying to take over the world, but I am trying to emphasize the message that it's not just about using Terraform or Ansible. You need a comprehensive story around DevOps. Sure. And the part that most people forget is, oh, we're using containers and using Kubernetes. Uh, if you read the DevOps handbook by uh, the same gentleman who wrote Continuous Delivery, yeah. um, you know, and one of the main critical pieces in that is feedback loops. Right. How, how much do you know about what's coming back in dev and production and QA? People just forget that part of the story. You know, well, we are using containers and using Terraform, so we are doing DevOps. And not really. So. I think it's taking over the world, uh, but we are abstracting it away as well. Sure. I just read a tool yesterday written in Rust that uses Helm and 
Kubernetes, uh, Helm charts and Kubernetes and Docker containers, Terraform and Ansible under the covers, you push a button and your application gets provisioned on AWS. Wow. And you don't have to do, and it's an open source tool and you don't have to do anything. It gets all tucked away under some abstraction. So, you know, there's a good chance people like me will be unemployed in like five years. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. We're, we're a pretty adaptable creature. There's no getting around it. I mean, I, I think about the stuff that we did 20 years ago, 15 years ago, 10 years ago, and it, and it is a constant, yeah. you know, evolution. And, and that's, that's part of being in this industry is you better be able to play with new toys, pick things up. So I, I'm pretty confident there'll be something else. And I, I do appreciate that we have coarser abstractions to work with. You know, I don't, I don't, wasn't that long ago per, per, proverbially where you had to say, well, if you're really into software, you write, you build your own hardware first. You know, so hopefully we're yep. beyond that, right? We, we buy some of these things off the shelf, but. Hopefully. Hopefully. Well, one thing that one, one thing that I have noticed is that sometimes we push the abstraction away so much that there is no good. We forget that people actually have to develop software. Right. So, you know, one thing that I've, at least, you know, I, I don't do much in the serverless land, but I know that, you know, there is no good development story around serverless. Like you have something out there and they say, yeah, you know, plop this code off right. this in this web UI and click. Right. Okay, great. But how do I debug that code? Like how do how do I how do I make my development environment that I know where's <laughs> your tool chain? <laughs> work with that. Right. So we've pushed it so far to that side that now you're like hapless at your own laptop. Right. Uh, <laughs> Well, that's, that's a great point. I mean, sometimes we take it too far, you know, and there's an argument to be made that that's how we learn where the edges are. And that's how we learn to come yeah. back. So like so many people, I'm baking bread. I started baking bread a couple of weeks ago and I didn't realize what a monster I was going to create because now my kid, every time I turn around, he's like, when are you going to make bread again? And it's like, okay, fine. But the the book that I've been using, the, this person has a, his whole approach to this is you, you want to burn a loaf in order to figure out how to come back from that. Like that's too much. So now dial it back. You know, you want to try these different things to an extreme to figure out where to dial back. And I think we do the same thing in software. You know, let's see what happens if we try using insert technology X here. And if it falls over, hey, we learned something. Now, unfortunately, that often means we just brought production down and we have some very upset customers or, hey, we put everything in US East. What could possibly go wrong? Yeah. Yeah. So I... I <clears throat> I think that, you know, you're right. We always push everything to the, a medium and, 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 and unfortunately the side effect of that is twofold. Like you said, right. You, you are already in production, something goes awry and you have no way to fix it without facing downtime and upset right. customers. But then the flip side also is that if there is one or two orgs that are really pushing the limits on, on certain things, the, the sort of architectural foundations that we have built over the last 20, 30 years, like I was giving a demo, I was teaching, uh, I think I was teaching a Docker class and I could not get my container to build, which was using a, a Gradle, the Gradle build tool inside it to build, so to build my piece of software. And, and so, I'm trying it and I'm like, I'm sorry. I don't know what happened. The demo crashed. You know how it is. Every, you know, yeah. Nothing ever goes well in a live demo. But then it turned out that that was the day when Cloudflare went down. And so, sure. you know, I mean, they literally shut down half the internet because the one, you know, so essentially they, they were so far ahead of the game that they've now become a single point of failure. Right. That the, the whole architectural paradigm that we've been pushing the last 30 years now is, well, is Cloudflare up? Right. <laughs> nothing works. So yes, we, we have to learn. I think we do that all the time in every RAM. I think, you know, people went down the microservices road, you know, this. Right. you've written a book on it. They swung the pendulum so hard on that side right. that now it's like, we've got this two line function running in that repository, which has got its own CI CD pipe. Right. Like, oh my right. God, what's going on? Thousands of lines of code, you know, to take two lines to production. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> But, but the, uh, yeah, I mean, it's how we learn. There's no getting around it. Now, the, the funny thing to me about so much of what we do in software, and I, I saw this when we got into the testing realm and we did TDD, the software engineer's approach to fixing something is let's make more software engineering. Let's let's take testing and make it more like software engineering. We did the same thing with ops. Well, you know, what sucks about ops is it's not more like software engineering. So let's make it more like software engineering. 
I, I wonder if, if we're sometimes look at that the wrong way. I, I don't know. I mean, we don't, what other techniques do we want to apply? Is, is, is that always the right answer to just put more software engineering into the picture? I, I, I don't know. I, I struggle with that a little bit. Um, and, and yeah, I mean, you know, the point I was trying to make earlier about GitOps is that now that, you know, people think, well, everything is in Git, we can do everything the way we've always done in Git does not work. Like you can't just slap together, you know, and, and you know, and, and even that's, for what it's worth, it's not just even us, right? If you look at the agile world, you know, once everyone got on the whole agile, Jira, Scrum bandwagon, unless you can't mold it in that shape, you're not really doing it right. Right, and and then everything falls apart. Then people are like, you know, you have you know Dave Thomas going on the road telling people Agile is dead. You know, capital A Agile is dead. Right. And, you know, and then now everyone's like pulling back and saying, how do we make this more flexible? Which is the whole point of Agile, but it was somehow lost for like 15 years. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. The same conversation. Uh, so I, I honestly, yeah, it's like a bunch of you know kids running around, you know. You know, they bring your, they bring their finger closer and closer to your face. I'm not touching you. I'm not touching you to see how far they can push it, uh, till 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 the fight breaks out, right? Right, right. <laughs> oh, I love that. That's a fun analogy. Yeah, I I do think one of the things we struggle with as an industry is we don't learn well from our past. You know, I I, I have this theory, and I know I've said this before, and it's familiar to you at least. But I think a lot of developers' time begins with the first language they learned, and they don't mm -hmm. think anything predated that which is not the case. I mean, I, I, where this really sort of came into focus for me back when Java was adding lambdas, somebody asked on some message board or some discussion list, you know, I don't understand why Java needs these newfangled lambdas. And it's like, lambdas aren't new. They've been around a while, you know, in fact, was originally supposed to be part of Java back when it wasn't called Java. But most of us don't have that history. And, and I, I wonder if that's part of the problem is we, we haven't, learn some of those lessons from the past and that's why you know the more experienced people are like oh you kids these days get off my lawn yeah. and and then we react like ah oh, what do you know you know gray beard it's like oh bet around the block i've seen that before you know i mean cloud's a perfect example of that to me i mean cloud is arguably a re-implementation of the mainframe you know big pile of compute we slice off what you need we charge it for what you use very different implementation obviously but mm -hmm same kind of concepts and yeah i, I don't know it, it's i wish we would be better at, at sort of learning from the past so i don't know yeah and i i i you know you know thanks to you know folks like you and mark richards and neil and you know pratik or you know um what i've learned is at, at, at you know when you're learning something new or you've just discovered you know let's you know you hear the word cloud native for the first time uh, I, I think that for 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 a for a short time while you are approaching that thing, um, you need to shelve all your preconceived notions, especially you know graybeards like us who've been around for, like I said, you know, twenty years. If you shelve that and sort of come at it from a beginner mind perspective, yeah. You, you get a better insight into what is this thing trying to do and then sort of layer on top of that the lens through which you normally look at the world with, right? Which is usually cynicism and skepticism, right? <laughs> but <laughs> but you, if, you, if you start with the cynicism and skepticism, what you lose out on is not being able to see what that thing really puts on the table, right. if anything. Right. Um, uh, I think that if I had approached containers um, with the same like sort of, you know, uh, uh, the, the, the burnt child dreads fire mentality that you may have come at with, you know, on-prem or VMs, you, you would, containers wouldn't have shown through the way they did. Like sure. you have to approach it and say, what does this give me? And now I can layer on everything else that sort of, you know, makes sense in that world. Right. And I think you had Venkat, on the stream as well, and yep. he, he speaks a lot about this. Is you, you you have a you have a duality between the beginner's mind and the uh, you know the guy sitting in, in in his porch with a shotgun yelling, "Get off my lawn!" <laughs> and, and you got to go back and forth as you right. adopt new mentalities. Um, but I think that one thing that people like you and me and you know Pratik and Neil have going for them is we get to teach it. 
Yeah. And the nice thing about teaching it is you have to start with a blank slate and say, how can I explain an idea or a concept or a, or a technique or an approach for somebody who may have never had any backdrop, right? So, so you, you, it's easier for people who teach a lot to get yeah. into the beginner mindset. I, at least I think so. Yeah. Uh, well, I think it's one of the best ways to learn, right? Is, is try to teach it to somebody and that'll force yep. you to think through your own assumptions and, and it will challenge some of those things. You know, I, I did a cloud native class earlier in the year and I was surprised. I thought I could skip over what is cloud native. And basically the first question I got as I was doing kind of tell me who you are, tell me what you're here for. What can I get for you today? And it's like, well, what is cloud native? I'm like, oh, okay, well, let's spend an hour talking about what we mean by cloud native. You know, I mean, glossaries yeah. turns out to be pretty useful artifacts on a lot of projects, but you know, you've, you've clearly picked up and learned a lot of technologies over your career. Do you have any sort of like tips, tricks, ways you use to try to learn something, you know, get, get up to speed on something? Um, so that is the, and I actually give a talk on being an effective developer. And one facet of that is how do you learn quickly? Right. Right. Uh, there's a handful of techniques that I use. Uh, you know, the, the, the one, which is the one you just sort of, sort of referred to was often referred to as the Feynman technique, which is t teach it to me like I'm five. Like yeah. Yeah, that, that mentality. Uh, for some things I use uh, uh, a program called Anki, which is oh. a flashcard program. Oh, sure. Uh, and then uh, for me, almost always what has worked is finding, first of all, I, I connect my brain to the fire hose. So I'm, I'm trying to learn Rust right now. Mm. And so I've connected myself to the Reddit sublang and I've connected myself to some people on Twitter who are constantly tweeting about Rust. And I'm just, I will read stuff on the Reddit sublang that I don't even, I don't have no idea what they're talking about. Sure. Right. But the nice thing about that is somewhere it registers. And when you get to a point where it does sort of start to make sense, somewhere in your head, something tells you, you've seen that before, right? Right. You know? Go go back to your archives, go back to your notes, go back to your flashcards and figure out where you saw this and, and things click a little better. But at the same time, I was, I'm pedantic and I'm academic. Uh, so for a long time, in my, early in my career, I always felt if I don't read the book cover to cover, I'm not, <laughs> you know. But now I've learned is just read the first chapter and try something, right? right? Try anything. Then once you hit the edges of that, read the next chapter and then try again. And then that sort of back and forth is the way I've always picked up uh, technologies quickly. But on, and then keep taking it to the whole other spectrum. I think that to, to truly, and one thing I try not to do is try not to teach things that I've not used in some sort of production setting because you never learn real something unless you put it in production. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it's just, it doesn't work. Like we, right. you know, even a simple tool like Ansible that we worked with for a client, I was sort of teaching it, you know, to small classrooms while we were trying to use it. But when we actually took it to production, I got a whole new talk out of it, which was like, you know, Ansible best practices, right. because that's when you know you really, learn this too right but yeah that's what i would say is <clears throat> little chunks flashcards are good there's another new have you heard of uh rome research no oh, that was a new one to me um uh, it's it's a note-taking tool it's not free sure uh, but it's basically a way to like have uh, backlinks between notes so every note is just one little you don't make you don't take long notes you take short notes like sure. flashcards like a wiki, you can link them oh, between cool. each other. And then it has a graphing algorithm that shows you where things connect, right? Oh, cool. Uh, so, you know, that's a not being an open source and free tool. There's an alternative called Foam. Okay. Instead sort of Roam. Foam is a Visual Studio Code plugin sure. that does the same thing. Interesting. It, you know, and, and that's been pretty useful for me as well sure. because it's kind of like writing flashcards, but 
you start to see you're sort of creating a mind map right. automatically right? right you're not writing the mind map the mind map reveals itself from your notes sure that works yeah well that's fascinating because i think where this gets really powerful is when you start to see those connections and that's where I think a lot of the really interesting tidbits lie is when you start to reflect on, hey, this is like the intersection of these two or three things. And, you know, that's a lot of times where that little nugget is is hiding. Oh, that's that's very cool. I'm, I'm not familiar with that. So I guess I have, it'll give me something to do here over the holiday period as, as things get a little quieter, which will be nice. <laughs> yeah, the, the most interesting thing about that is when you start to make connections between two things that are completely disconnected. Right. Right. Yeah. It's sort of like, you know, when you get that sort of while going off in your head and you're taking a shower because right. you, you, you see the sprawl of nodes and you say, oh, I, I somehow that and that look really close to each other. Maybe there's a connection there and you can make a leap, a conceptual leap. And it's pretty powerful. Well, and, and I, I think you bring up a good point. You need to have some of that distance in order to see that. And one of the things I think we all struggle with, especially during the pandemic time, is to get that break to disconnect. You know, do you have any thoughts on that? I mean, what do you do to to get away from technology? Um, I, uh, well, so like you, Michelle and I are hunting around for TV shows because we sort of. Both we'll we'll talk more about that. Year. Believe me, that's on my list. <laughs> Yeah, and I mean, you know, one thing that I've done really well, um, so, you know, I I haven't been good for the last year and a half, but for a long time in my life, uh, I used to meditate every day. And sure. That, it, you know, so that ability to switch off and on switches. Um, when, I, when I stop work in the evening, unless I'm, you know, working on some pet project and I disconnect, you know, people always tell me, oh, I'm always like thinking about work I don't do that. Like I don't have any background loop that's going, that's making me think about work. When I shut off, I'm completely shut off. So, you know, if I'm cooking or I am um, washing the dishes, uh, because I, I did meditation for a long time, I can literally shut the whole world out. Like, there's no background thread. There's nothing. Um, and so I like to read. Yeah. And, and you and I have talked about this. Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> Um, so yeah, I read a lot. I think this year I will finish. I, I think I'm close to a record. I read a lot of fiction for yeah. what it's worth. Um, so it's brain candy. You can sort of flip through pretty quickly, but I think I'm on a record of like 65 or 70 books. Get a lot of this guy. I, I'm definitely on a record. Yeah. Cranking through it. Well, some yeah. of those are pamphlets like mine. So that doesn't count. That's, <laughs> that's like a third of a book. I don't know. I don't know. Maybe if you read it three times, then it counts as a real book. I don't know. Probably. Yeah. I mean, mileage like may vary. you probably have to read three times. So well, maybe. I don't know. I don't know. It's probably fine. Or at least download it three times. That'll, <laughs> that'll make somebody happy somewhere. But uh, somewhere. That, that's that's powerful. I I struggle with that personally. You know, what, what tends to happen to me, and it always happens seemingly right as I fall asleep, is when that loop comes through that says, here's the whole list of things that you didn't get to today. You know, you forgot to email this. You didn't respond to that. You know, and it's like, okay all right fine you know and then i sit there and stare at the ceiling trying not to wake up christine as much as i can but, but yeah it's it's i think it's an important thing to be able to do that to be able to switch yeah. off and it's yeah. not not easy so maybe i'll have to try meditation i don't know yeah i mean i i have recommended it for uh the longest time to folks even if it's a 10 minute right it, i mean i don't do more than 20 I, when i used to do it i haven't been good this year at all but uh, it's because you're reading it, all those books. Max, true. Uh, 25 minutes was my max. Wow. Uh, I'm, you know, and and another tip I'll give you. Speaking back of you know me being terrible at technology, um, is you know I can just reach into my back pocket and you've seen these. Oh yeah. Heck yeah. Yeah. I got, but, uh, got one of these right right here on my desk. So you know. Yeah. 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 I I. If, if I get that weird thought in the middle of the night or as I'm going to bed, you got to email this or you got to finish that, I don't use my phone. Mm. It's always pen and paper. Sure. Um, because then you're not tempted to see that notification that said, you know, hey, Nate Shooter tweeted your, retweeted your tweet. I'm, oh, let me check and see how many likes I got. All of that goes away, right? It's, it's plain paper. And I run through those 
I don't know, one every month, month and a half. Yeah. It's just scribblings. But right, right. They work. Yeah. Wait, you know, I don't remember which version of iOS this came in on, but they allowed you to set up like your bedtime routine and that became one of the features. And I turned that on and that's fantastic because about 45 minutes before you say you want to go to bed, it kind of pings you and is like, hey, it's time to start winding down. And then once you hit your, your whatever you've declared as your bedtime, it, it shuts everything off. You know, your, your phone goes into don't disturb mode and your watch does the same thing. And, and I did that certainly when I traveled, I'd always turn that on at night because, you know, like me, you certainly have been in lots of time zones and some people don't realize you're in a different time zone and they call you and it's two in the morning and you're like, oh, what's going on? You know, and then you're up for an mm -hmm. hour and a half. So I've gotten pretty good at turning it on, but I like the fact that it just sort of automatically happens. And, you know, there's, there's something to be said about just getting in that mindset of, all right, it's, it's time. Let's not focus on that. But so speaking of TV shows, what are you binging these days? What are you watching? How are you getting through the <laughs> pandemic? You know, that's, that's what we're at. I, when we got started, today, you and I were talking about that. So what, uh, what's, what, what should I add to my list? Um, I don't think there's anything that I watch that, tickles your fancy. I'm trying to um, remember. So Michelle is not a big uh, like sort of suspense, you know me, me and the murder stories. Yeah. Talk, uh, mention that book series that, that you like. That's the instruction manual, I think is the way I refer to it. Uh, <laughs> it's uh, John Sanford's uh, uh, Prey series. So that's the, I mean, he's got like 27 books. It's Lucas Davenport. Uh, and he's basically, a, he, 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 he now sort of works with the U.S. Marshal. I think the latest book he's working with the U.S. Marshal. And his basic profile is hunting serial killers. Nice. And so the books get pretty dark. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. Uplifting. But yeah, but they're a fast read. I sure. mean, you know, even the Jack Reacher series that, have you seen the Jack Reacher oh, yeah. movies with Tom Cruise? I've read some of them. Huh? Those are fantastic. I'm going to find my entertainment list here. I keep a list of everything I watched. Of course he does. <laughs> yeah. So, um, yeah, we watched um, Killing Eve, oh. which, which is, uh, have, you, have you heard of that show? That, that's new to me. It's, it's a very interesting show. It's unfortunately another serial killer uh, yeah, what, that, what is it with you and the serial killers <laughs> here my friend i mean is there some something i need to know about i've known you a long time um you know it's probably fine probably fine you know <laughs> probably fine in all fairness i didn't even pick the show Michelle oh, oh the well show. then it's fine yeah yeah it's, it's you know how like you know married couples start to look like each other after like a couple of years I think I might be rubbing off a of funnel, but basically it's an assassin and a cop and sort of inter it's both are women. So both okay. women lead characters. It's a superb show in that regard. And it's just the way they interact with each other. It's kind sure. of wonky. It's kind of weird. Um, and then uh, I've been, um, and then lately we just started watching Top of the Lake, which oh. is Elizabeth Moss. Okay. Uh, she's the same lady from Handmaid's Tale. Okay. And she's a cop and it's a TV show. But yeah, we haven't seen anything for a while that we thought, yeah, that's, yeah. We can't wait to watch the next episode. So we are sort of hunting around to find something. Well, I, I would recommend Ted Lasso if you're looking for something. It's not about serial killers. So I know it's not quite in your wheelhouse, <laughs> but it, it's, it is the right content for 2020. It, it, is, it is uplifting. It is funny. It's, you know, without being saccharine in nature or cloyingly you know sweet it it's one of the few shows i've seen recently where i constantly rewound 30 40 seconds because it was so funny like the joke was so good you're like i need to hear that again and we finished it and we're immediately like all right when are we gonna watch it again when are we gonna go back through it because it was so good you know it's 10 episodes they're half an hour ish long it's just fantastic i'm a huge huge ted lasso fan so you know can't wait for more of those <laughs> Is it one word or two words? Ted two words. Lasso. It's a name. It's the name of the character, Ted Lasso. He's it's okay. it's. If you remember when Premier League first started showing up here in the states, NBCSN put together this character, Ted Lasso, who is an American football coach who is going to take over a a soccer team, and so it was all him not understanding anything about football, and they turned that into a show, and it's 
freaking amazing. So Jason okay, Sudeikis, yeah, it's, oh, it's so good, so good. But anyway, yeah, that's... I've I've been eyeing the Expanse on that's now on Amazon. Okay, but was previously I've heard it's fantastic, but just before I started, I heard that there's a book series behind it. Oh. So I'm plowing through the book series okay. <laughs> before I start watching the show. And it's a show that I'll have to watch by myself. Michelle's not into the whole. For what it's worth, and, and you might be interested about this, and I think a lot of people who are listening might be interested, is... At least Pratik. The, at least Pratik. Um, so the the book series is... Um, I mean, they now call it the Expanse book series because okay. the show is so popular. Uh, it's uh, James Corey, mm -hmm. and they are actually two people. So it's a pseudonym for two authors working together on the book series. And they are uh, George R.R. R. Martin's protégés. Oh. So they they learned a lot of their writing style from George R.R. R. Martin. And so the way that people describe it, it's, lo it's, uh, it's Game of Thrones, but sci-fi version. So That's lots of characters with multiple names and most of them die. <laughs> I can't reveal too much, but I do know that lurking in the distance, because this is, you know, we are, we are traveling through space, and okay. all kinds of fancy things. Lurking in is the, the same thing as the things behind the wall. Right, there's this oh. Im impending doom that's coming upon us Fantastic. while we squabble amongst ourselves. Perfect. Essentially, Perfect. Yeah. Yeah. And and I'm I'm guessing lots and lots of plot threads just to to keep you engaged. So. Yeah. But honestly, it's you know I'm not a big sci-fi guy, okay. um, but this book really worked for me. I mean, the, the entire series is good, uh, but they are big books though. Like six hundred pages, seven hundred pages a book. They're pretty big books. So that um, that might take yeah. you about a week and a half, based on what you said earlier. So, <laughs> that's right. yeah, yeah, that's fair. That's fair. Yeah, and then I read uh, the fifth season. Have you heard of that? No. Oh, that's fine. that was referred to me by our friend Mark Richards. Okay. Uh, it's another. Uh, how come Mark, TV how come Mark doesn't give me any of these recommendations? I'm gonna I'm gonna have to have words with him on on the Friday session here. I don't understand what's going on. It's leaving yeah, me out in the uh, cold. It's a, uh, that's another, it's a three book series. And I believe it's, so first of all, it's, a, it's, it's fantasy ish, sci-fi okay. and fantasy mixture. Uh, it is a female author. Um, and I believe she's the only author in history who has won uh, Hugo's for every book in a series in consecutive years. Wow. So she won one Hugo for every book in 2015, 16, and 17, I think. Ouch. She won. Yeah. So it's, uh, yeah, it's pretty, it's a pretty no, cool. No book pressure series. when you bring out the, the next book. Like, is it as good as the previous <laughs> ones? Is it a Hugo winner? Eh. Yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> that would give you some writer's block, I think. That, that would slow you down. You're like, this has to be good. I have, I've set the bar and, and now I need to, to meet it again. Yowza. Yeah. Yowza. Yeah. So, so like me, you typically spend a lot of time on the road. You've been stuck in, in the home. So where are you looking forward to visiting once this is all over and we can sort of kind of resume some normalcy, whether that's in six months or a year, you know, who knows? Any place you're dying to get to? Um, so I personally, you know, this year, the one location I did miss a lot was Denver mm. uh, because it gives me a chance to hang out with our friend Venkat. Mm -hmm. and we go hiking in the mountains and yeah, when you I guys know, say hike you mean it you know and every time i see that invite i'm always like wait a minute this is going to start at three in the morning and we're going to get to the summit at like one in the afternoon like and how many feet of elevation gain yeah no i'm i'm good i'm gonna just stay here yeah. on the ground thank you for asking but yeah so most of summer was venkat uh, sending me pictures uh, every time he hiked a mountain with Kavita. He's like, we're well, right. thinking about you. And I'm like, um, but yeah, you know, Michelle, my wife may not be that keen on Denver. I, I think she's, she's, we may have to leave the country. Okay. <laughs> at some point we have to leave the country just to get out and do something else. Right. Uh, I mean, at this point, the boys who never care for vacations are like, 
we need to go somewhere. I'm like, okay, we may have reached a, yes, <laughs> we yes. may have reached the finality of this conversation. No, I, there, there is a point at which you're just, you know, I, the one thing I will say, I've enjoyed the fact that I've been home, right? You know, normally we spend a lot of time on the road and it's nice to, to sleep in your own bed. It's nice to be around your family and, and do the things you can only do at home. But you do hit a point where it's like, this is 10 months and you're, so, I totally understand people who are, are having a hard time with this at this point. You know, there, there is some truth to being around people too often, you know, so it'll be fascinating to see how that snaps back. And, you know, this, this will be, I, you know, I'm curious again to see kind of how this all wraps up in, in 2021, but, but I'm definitely looking forward to not being around my home for a couple of days, but yeah, it, oh, it's, it'll be interesting. How, how about, uh, Favorite restaurants. I, I know at least a few of the times you and I have been out, you've, you've dragged me to some place and then I just let you order and I'm just like, thank you more, please. And so what, what, do you, what, where are you looking forward to getting to that, that you haven't been able to eat at this year? Any, any place in particular you're excited about? Um, I'm, I mean, you know, me, uh, you know, whenever it's funny, I was just going to mention that, you know, whenever I talk to the boys, I'm talking to Michelle and I'm talking about like restaurants and foodies. I'm talking about the adventures you and Neil have had, you know, flying to London. Uh, I, I, who is the Chef Ramsay's like flagship restaurant? Chef, I think Chef it is. Claire. Well, now it's all about, I'm all about Claire. Uh, I've, I've been to Ramsay's multiple times, but but now it's okay. it's all core by Claire Smith for me. Thank you for asking. Um, but I always talk about that. And the funny thing is that I have never been, for, for one thing, you know, there are very few restaurants that, are sort of high endish that are very are, are purely vegetarian focused. Oh sure, right. So um, that with that said, um, there's a couple of places in Columbus. Like there's a um, I kind of El Condados or whatever. It's a taco place, and I mean they make the most delicious tacos. And uh, there's another place in Columbus which is Venezuelan food uh, and it is delicious. Yum. Um, so we are hoping just to get in and the takeout thing sort of works, but you know, there's it's something the to be said to, yeah. Um, but yeah, I can't, the, the food that we buy, you know, we never exceeds like you know, 12 bucks a dish or whatever. Right. That's, that's, that's the, but yeah, there's, there's, there's that Venezuelan food and the taco place are two places I'm looking forward. I have too much pizza this year. Oh God. So, no it, more it, pizza. It's hard, you know, and you do get tired after a little while of kind of the repetition and I, I, I get it, you know, it's a challenge and you know, you gotta, yeah. you gotta stretch a little bit for sure. But uh, yeah. And unfortunately, I think one of my favorite restaurants in Columbus, I think they've closed permanently, oh, because, yeah. which is unfortunate. I feel yeah. I'm hoping they open back up, but they have been closed throughout COVID. So I, I'm not really cross. You know, I won't hold my breath that they would come back. But yeah, that, if they close, I'm gonna I'm gonna miss that place. It was the go-to for Michelle and me. Almost, yeah. You know, it was Indo Chinese fusion. Mm, yeah, uh, that was really good. Uh, but, yeah, there there have been at least a handful of very well regarded restaurants here in the Twin Cities that that for whatever reason, uh, you know, use the pandemic as an, ex as a reason to shut down and they're not coming back. And that sucks because they're great restaurants. They're highly acclaimed. And, you know, you really feel bad about, about losing that. I think that's, that's one of those lasting impacts that's going to come out of this is how many of these little businesses, small businesses, medium sized businesses couldn't survive. And yeah, it's hard, hard to recreate that to say the least, but yeah. Well, let, let me throw some lightning round questions at you. We'll see what kind of fun that gets us into. So coffee, espresso, or tea? Ooh, coffee. Okay. All right. And how much is the proper amount of coffee to consume in a day? <laughs> um, if, if, if the hand been, doesn't shake, you haven't had enough. That's right. <laughs> no, I actually have been pruning almost or trying to prune every dependency in my life for last three to four years. So my coffee is let's say a carafe, I think it's two cups. Okay. That's what I, and I'm done. All right. um, and I don't get uh, caffeine headaches. So even if I skip coffee in a day, I, I don't, I like the warm liquid in the morning, but right. I don't miss it. Right. You don't, you um, don't need it to function. It doesn't get you to normal. Yeah. <laughs> that's right. 
Yeah. <laughs> Pie or cake? You know, both is an acceptable answer as well, you know. Yeah, no, I, I am. If I'm going to eat something, it's going to be a, I mean, I'm not a dessert guy, but I'll okay. eat cake. All right. All right. Pie doesn't fair. do it for me. All right. Now, now, you and I are both Midwesterners here, and so we have neither of these things. Uh, oceans <laughs> or mountains? Which one do you want? Um, it's funny that I grew up by the ocean. So I spent 20 years by the ocean. Um, and, you know, it's always been a part of my life that, I, I mean, I like water, but I like, you know, if I go to a lake, it's a place that I want to be. Um, but coming to the U S you know, one place that you and I go every year or used to go every year is Florida. Yeah. We spend December in for conferences and at least in the U S usually the ocean limits my food options. Oh, sure. Because it's a lot of fish and seafood sure. and you surf know, and turf. Yeah. Surf and turf. Um, so the last, I would say last 10 years, I would say I would, I would head towards the mountains than towards the water. Okay. My, my son decided this fall that it would be useful if Minnesota could trade some of its lakes for some mountains, since, you know, we, we have a lot of water and certainly Colorado doesn't need all those teeners. So just give us a couple. We'll give you, I don't know, a thousand lakes. That seems like a good trade. A thousand lakes for a few of those. You wouldn't even notice. And we'd have some place to go. I'm pretty sure the yeah. highest point in Minnesota is like nine. Well, at least in my county is like 960 feet or something like that. You know, we don't we don't get That's, close to yeah. uh, the, you know the mile high or anything like that here. But uh, it's fine. It's <laughs> That's fine. what Ohio is, flatlands. <laughs> well, so, you know, I, I started riding bikes five, five, six years ago, and you realize that in in our part of the world there really aren't anything more than like little hills that you have to go over, and most of them are short. Mm -hmm. A couple summers ago, Christine and I did a bike tour in sort of southeastern Minnesota, right along the border with Wisconsin, which has some great riding on it. They got a lot of great roads that are all paved, and and but they don't have a lot of traffic on it because that's where all the dairy farmers are. And so you've got these roads that are designed to make sure the milk doesn't get all jostled on the way to market. Well, there's bluff country down there, you know, because you go down to the river valley and then you come back up out of the river valley. Well, to get from the river valley to the bluff side is a couple miles. And you realize, oh, this isn't just the normal 45 second effort. This is a three mile climb. And of course, if you are in Colorado, you're like three miles. What are you talking about? You know, we have a 20 K, you know, ride that gains 3000 feet of elevation. It's like, oh, uh, well, right. yeah, I'd have different gearing if I, if I lived there for sure. So we, we yeah. talked a lot about food because, you know, for me, it's, it's, I didn't get to eat lunch today because I had to go straight from teaching to talking <laughs> to you, which is great. I love doing it. I'd, you know, rather be busy than not. But uh, food trucks or Michelin stars, which, which one are you going to gravitate towards? Mm -hmm. Food trucks. Okay, All right, I hear that. We'll yeah. get you. We'll get you to some Michelin stars though before the, you know, twenty twenty one. I was going to say before the year is out, but we only got like two weeks left. Thank goodness. Now you read a lot of books this year. Were they eBooks or were they paper books? And which one do you prefer? Paper. Okay. And I prefer paper. Um, I think that it's funny that when I'm going through a Kindle, I mean, I will read books on Kindle. Like if there's, if the book isn't available or if I can't get it, sure. I'll buy it on Kindle. But it's funny that I can somehow remember a page. Like I can remember, I saw this on the left-hand side yep. or the right-hand side. Yep. Third of the way the down. Page. Yep. But I can't remember that on a Kindle. So right. flipping back and forth becomes problematic. And uh, you know, especially like you said, uh, sort of if you're reading Game of Thrones in space, there's sure. a lot of characters and you're trying to remember who is this person. Right. X-Ray is really cool on Kindle. Sure. Right? It, it, but at the same time, like sometimes I don't remember what happened there and it's easier for me to flip the book than it is. Uh, but yeah, I mean, even your book, um, it was 60 pages, I think. Something like I that. I double printed it out um, and then I read it on paper. Interesting. Um, and then I got Mark and Neil's book uh, signed by them. So I got Ooh. a physical copy and I got it signed by them. So physical. Yep. Paper, yeah. paper all the way. Yep. I, I actually do have a paper copy. They both signed. And what's funny is I, I had Mark sign it first and 
he gave me like this very vague sort of thanks for reading or something like that. Clearly the, like what he writes on every one. And I'm like, really, you couldn't do better than that. And I was just being glib, right? I was just trying to be funny about it. I didn't really, I didn't really care. And so the next day he came over with another copy he said, here, I'm sorry. I wrote a better one here. And I'm like, oh, okay. <laughs> so, so here you can have this one back and give it to some random, you know, attendee, I guess. I don't know what he did with it, but, but yeah, it's fine. So it's funny that you're reading Game of Thrones in space because the next one I'm always at, I'll always love to ask people is Game of Thrones or Lord of the Rings. Um, I haven't read Lord of the Rings, oh, okay, so I right. can't really. It's on my list, um, but uh, you know, I read the Game of Thrones. I read the first four books of Game of Thrones, then I sure. kind of gave up. Yeah, but understandable. Yeah, that's not. That's not my thing. Okay. Um, I mean, even the show, like Michelle was, my wife was more into it than I was. I watched it mostly because she was watching it. But if, you know, they had, if they had decided, yeah, we had done it after season four, I would have shrugged and moved on. Like, oh, wow. Fa fantasy is not my genre. That's it's fair. Just, not, enough, not enough serial killers, apparently. Just, <laughs> it's fine. It's fine. <laughs> now, I'm guessing this changes based on, you know, whether we're in pandemic time or not, but action comedy or drama what what's your preference um if i'm going to pick um if i'm flipping netflix and on my by myself it would always be action then okay. comedy very rarely drama okay but yeah lately like uh, what was that uh, green book mm. was mm -hmm. it green book I mean, that was a fantastic movie uh, the same actor as uh, the road yeah vigo like hugo mortens yeah okay. uh, but yeah anyways but yeah, that would be my order. Okay. We recently watched Paradise. Have you seen it? No. Oh, you need to see this movie. Okay. All right. It is a South Korean movie. Uh, it is subtitled. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Now I know what you mean. Yes. I have not seen it, though. It's, it. it's on my list. You got to watch it. Okay. Fantastic All right. movie. All yep. right. I would have never picked it. Sure. Michelle made me watch it, and I am glad I watched it. All right. It's good for you. It's like eating broccoli, you know, for, for us meditarians. I, I think I know the answer to this, but I'm curious to see if I'm right or wrong. Cats or dogs? I am. Well, okay. So I was always a, well, I should say always a dog person. Ever since I met Michelle, my wife, she's always had dogs and she had cats initially. So when we moved in together, we had a dog and a cat. I like dogs better. Okay. But now we have Zara. We just adopted or we rescued her this January and she is a hoot. So I'm sort of on the fence with cats right now, but okay. definitely dog person. All right. Yeah. All right. That's fair. That's fair. Cabs or spaces? Oh, so I, I am, I've been a space person for a long time. Okay. But the Golang ecosystem is tabs. Oh. And I thought to myself, why is that? And so the creators of the language, which are, by the way, Rob Pike and Ken Thompson, two of the heavyweights in the Unix and Plan 9 world, mm -hmm. they justified it by saying, if you make everything tabs, then most editors will let you adjust how big a tab looks on your screen, right? Sure. So if you can say a tab should show up as two spaces or four spaces. So if you like more space, just adjust it. The trouble with spaces is if you pick two spaces, two That's spaces it. is always two spaces. Right. And so now I'm thinking, oh, they might hmm. be onto something. Interesting. But all my code right now, every repository on my machine, except for the Golang ones, are all spaces. That's fair. <laughs> That's fair. See, this is not the, the religious debate I want to get into because I, I just, <laughs> I of all the battles I can fight in a project, this is pretty low on the list, to be real honest with you. But uh, th yeah. this one, I, for, I, oh, go ahead. I think Golang did the right thing there. Sure. They, they, they ship with the formatter. Sure. So, you know, when you build your code and you say go fumped, it formats your code and there's no debate. They have sure. fixed everything for you. Just live with it. There, so there's there something no to be said for those opinions and, and taking some of those decisions out of the equation. It, it, you know, we, we have this tendency to believe that having more choice is always better. And in a lot of cases, having more choice just makes life harder. You know, so sometimes eliminating some options is in our best interest. That, that's what I struggle with. Slack with... conversation. Oh, okay. Well, I mean, <laughs> The, the thing that, that I struggle with right now with all these different streaming services and streaming options is you, you get sort of sucked into that. There's literally everything at my disposal. So what am I going to watch tonight? 
You know, and I think back to when you and I were were younger people and you watched whatever was on network television at that time. And that's the way it was. And you went, oh, okay. So pluses and minuses. But anyway, well, I'm amazed that it's already been an hour, my friend. And I don't want to take any more of your precious time. See, it it goes fast because I never get a chance to talk to you, you know, other than these these sort of one-off things. So I'm, I'm thank you so much for hanging out with me. How can people find you if they want you to come train them or learn more from you? I, I know your your Twitter handle is one of my all time favorites. Is there a story behind that? I've never asked yeah, you that. So, I love your Twitter handle. Thank you. It's uh, for those who are listening. It's loosely tight, uh, and it came when I was knee deep in the Ruby world. Uh, I sort of got swung into the dynamic languages world, and then um, I was you know I was trying to find a good domain name for myself and. You know, dynamically tight was taken, I think. Okay. So and I woke up one night at two o'clock. I still remember. I still remember the moment in time when I woke up in the middle of the night and I'm like loosely tight. And so I, you know, Googled it and no one had the domain and no one had the, you know, I, so I snapped up the domain at two o'clock in the morning. And then I was thinking to myself, like, wonder if there's a Twitter handle. And I, you know, like you, I was early on the Twitter yep. sort of, you know, we were on the, the beta list or whatever. So I've had tw- loosely typed ever since then. So, Lightning yeah, struck. I, <laughs> yep, yep. So yeah, got loosely typed.com and at loosely typed on Twitter. Fantastic. Well, my friend, thank you so much for hanging out with me. I really appreciate it. My, my best to your lovely wife and give the pets a pat from me. And I look forward to seeing you in person and giving you a big hug. I, I just I miss hanging out with you, buddy. I do too. And I thank you for having me. Uh, thanks for everyone who was listening. And um yeah, I I cannot wait to sit down and and have a few drinks and a few you know, j- jovial jabs as the as the as the way we do camaraderie. It's uh, there's always a <laughs> or or we can it's not always a smooth going. <laughs> well, it, it reminds me of those times where we we've been flipping through various YouTube clips <laughs> and showing each other. Oh my God, you got to see this! You know, that's that's given us a lot of joy. So I, I look forward to having some of that in 2021 with you in person, my friend. Yeah, hopefully we'll do it at my place if you I guess will come down to Columbus. That'll be absolutely. Fun. You know, I I love yeah. coming to Columbus. People give the O H I O a bad name. I don't know why. I love Columbus. It's a great city. You know, there's a lot of cool stuff, dude. A lot of great people there. So, and good food. We do our best. Lots of good food. Great food. Yeah. yeah. So I, I just gained a pound and a half because we talked about Columbus food. So <laughs> it's not quite Austin, to be fair, but it's very good. So it's underrated. So, well, thank you, Raju. I appreciate it, my friend. Join us next week. We'll have the many times mentioned today, Neil Ford. That was not deliberate. That was I, I didn't prime Raju with any of that, but we're going to have what Neil referred to as a special holiday edition. He chose that week. So, we'll see what happens you know we'll we'll try to get into what neil's favorite holiday song is so stay tuned for that right it's it's uh the key is he doesn't like holiday music so we'll see what kind of trouble that gets me into (laughs) but anyway thank you so much my friend again hugs to everybody and we'll see you see you soon i'm sure i hope cheers